from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Peloton has a new CEO, but still needs a bidder. Shares riding high on the news. More on the massive shakeup at the iconic bike maker. Plus, M&A mania for Microsoft. Now the tech giant is looking to buy the cybersecurity juggernaut Mandiant. We'll tell you why. And leveling the playing field in technology. We'll talk to a young company spun out of a Google incubator that's taking on the $100 billion software recruiting industry and trying to make Silicon Valley more fair. We'll get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets. U.S. stocks rising in a broad-based rally. Our Kriti Gupta with us for more. Kriti, big day. Yeah, Emily, stocks taking a rebound. Big tech really leading the way. And of course, this comes even as you start to hear, see the 10-year yield nearing that 2% level. Now, the consensus here is that you might see a little bit of volatility when you hit that 2%. But really, all in all, if you're looking at the correlation, that relationship between yields and tech, well, Emily, it's positive. And that's why you're seeing both yields higher and tech higher on the same day. That is good news for anyone who was worried about a 2021 repeat. But the real highlight in today's macro stock action is coming from those Chinese ADR just shy of 4% gains in that space after a little bit more policy support from China, boosting the likes of Alibaba, JD, uh, and the likes. I want to move to a deal news, some deal news here. You mentioned it in the intro, Microsoft and Mandiant. Microsoft potentially in talks to buy cybersecurity firm Mandiant. This would actually help them kind of boost up their cloud offerings a little bit, and specifically their investment in cybersecurity. You remember about 35% of Microsoft's revenue comes from the cloud, so this would actually help with that portfolio. Uh, let's move to another stock this morning morning or I should say this afternoon and that of course is Lyft after the bell reporting earnings that are not actually meeting what investors want to hear Lyft revenue beating estimates riders though still falling short the estimate was about 20 million riders they only got just shy above 18 million so you can see Lyft shares really taking a hit after hours Uber in line with that but I think the biggest story Emily today despite all the tech mania is of course going to be with Peloton and it's going to be that story of a round trip essentially going all the way back to the September of 2019 was well, that IPO price that we actually tested today and you can really see that the peak January of 2021 Peloton really becoming a proxy for this pandemic trade that you see in 2020 and then comes right back down in 2021 now dealing with management changes pretty weak earnings and of course uh, a potential of a major major uh, deal in the works. All right, so not quite all the way around some ways to go. Of course, we'll see what happens. That's pretty. Thank you. I do want to stick with Peloton. Those big changes afoot with co-founder John Foley stepping down as CEO, becoming executive chair. He'll be replaced by the former CFO of Spotify and Netflix, Barry McCarthy. Rohit Kulkarni of MKM Partners with us now to discuss. Rohit, also 2,800 employees out, including some top hardware executives. Is this the kind of shakeup you want to see? Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, this is just a sign of how uh, quickly and uh, how soft the demand has gotten at uh, Peloton over the last four to five months uh, in terms of how they, are, how they need to aggressively uh, cut costs, uh, cut investments, cut growth plans. I think uh, uh, the stock market reaction partially aids Barry McCarthy coming back and partially I think uh, Peloton being aggressive enough uh, to uh, cut costs and show that they can be a standalone, sustainable, profitable business. Now, I've interviewed John Foley a couple of times since the pandemic began, and this was him just about a year ago talking about his vision for the future. Take a quick listen. For years and years and years, no one believed in us. And now you have Apple saying this is important enough category that we're investing in uh, and streaming digital fitness as well. Um, and then on and on, you're seeing some of the big players from fitness of yesteryear trying to uh, create connected products and, and then uh, other uh, newcomers. But it really is, I think, legitimization and saying everyone in the industry is seeing that the future of fitness is at home. Now, certainly part of the future of fitness must be at home. So where do you think Foley went wrong? Uh, near term, I think demand forecasting is was a hard problem. Uh, the product that they are sell selling is a considered purchase. It's a purchase that you probably wait for maybe three, six months to eventually buy. 
uh, what the pandemic did was it made into a from a considered purchase into an impulse purchase. So you are now you're buying something that is very expensive just because you're saving some money on the outside. There are uh, government subsidies and likes like that, that made into an impulse purchase that probably obfuscated what the addressable market is for this product. So now the consumer uh, behavior pendulum is swinging all the way away from uh, Peloton right now. So. We'll, we'll need some time to settle down and see where the actual addressable market is going to look like. I feel so, that there is going to be, yeah, go ahead. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, who comes next. Barry McCarthy, mm -hmm. former CFO of Spotify and Netflix, fully saying McCarthy and his wife are big Peloton riders, big fans of the brand. What do you make of this decision? Is he the right person to ride Peloton into the sunset? <laughs> I, I like the way you phrased it. Uh, what I would say is, again, he brings credibility with investors. He bring, brings credibility with Wall Street when he says he will probably say things conservatively over the next six months. Probably people will give, give him uh, uh, the benefit of doubt. Uh, right now, in the last six months, what has happened is uh, Peloton management team has lost credibility, ability, or any conviction that uh, investors had that they can forecast uh, the demand that they are seeing in front of them. What Barry McCarthy brings in is that. I feel beyond three to six months, uh, he probably will uh, do another shakeup uh, in a way that uh, will right size the ship in with regards to what demand they are seeing then, which could probably be lower than what we are seeing today. So uh, maybe the cuts that we are seeing today are not as aggressive enough as uh, uh, eventually the right size of the ship is going to look like. All right, well, we'll see. Certainly, if a deal happens, a wide range of names being floated as potential owners from Apple to Amazon, Disney, Nike. We'll be watching Rohit Kulkarni of MKM Partners. Thank you for joining us. I want to stick with earnings, move on to Lyft. The ride-hailing company reporting fourth quarter sales that beat estimates driven by higher prices due to a shortage of drivers. But Lyft reporting fewer riders than expected amidst the Omicron surge. Our Jackie Davalos, who covers Lyft for us, has all the details. Jackie, what are your big takeaways here? You know, it was a bittersweet moment for uh, Lyft's results today. You know, one of the things that stuck out was this active rider revenue. Um, figure, which basically tracks how well uh, Lyft is able to monetize their, their users, but also how frequently they're coming back and um, you know how many of them have actually joined the platform in the past quarter. And so what we saw was you know, an all-time high, but you know, that has uh, a two real um, things to attribute it to, which one of them uh, was contributing um, you know, this uh, um, this idea that you know prices have been so high for you know the past few months since the second quarter when they peaked driver shortage is really driving that that increase and it really translated into this metric because you know riders are, are taking more airport rides but they also cost more um, you know we also saw a seasonality uh, it, you know, impact part of, you know, what we saw in terms of, you know, people, are they taking rides? Are they shorter? Are they longer? And so uh, from one perspective, you know, Lyft could tout that, you know what, we're able to monetize this and we are gaining some users, but not at the pace that investors are actually uh, looking for. And so, you know, that number came in um, about 2 million short than the, than the riders that analysts wanted to see. And that right. really would have put it into 2019 pre-pandemic levels. Well, you wonder if Lyft and Uber, uh, we're going to be seeing Uber's results tomorrow, need a full recovery in riders if they can charge more and if the riders that are still riding are willing to pay that. What do you think? You know, it's it's going to be a balance. That's what investors are really uh, focused on. It's not just about how much you can extract from a customer, but it's also, you know, are you deterring them from coming back onto the platform? And so, you know, now that subsidies have been pulled back, now that driver shortages are still somewhat uh, hanging in uncertainty with Omicron uh, expected to be uh, an impact, a negative impact in the first quarter primarily. Um, so I think there is going to be some uncertainty as to how they balance both, you know, the driver supply, the rider demand. And, um, you know, at what point do, you know, you say maybe we have to subsidize prices again, but that's definitely going to be a part of the conversation. Now the profitability is going to continue to be a, a priority.
So what are your expectations for Uber based on what you saw with Lyft, knowing that Uber has rides but also eats, which, to be fair, has been doing better than rides since the pandemic began? You're absolutely right. Delivery actually overtook uh, Uber's mobility business in terms of bookings and revenue. Uh, and it really was this cushion that Lyft just was not lucky enough to have and to be able to rely on. So what we were able to really deduce from Lyft's results is that Uber uh, will see some kind of an impact uh, in December. You know, they spoke to investors uh, late in December and, you know, actually acknowledged that Omicron was having uh, somewhat of a hit unto, to its rides. Um, but, you know, we will start to see more of a focus around the profitability of the Eats uh, segment. And that's something that's going to come, come forth in Uber's results tomorrow. They were very close um, in, in posting a pretty good profitability number in, in Q3. Um, and, you know, Omicron might be bad for rides, but it's certainly good for delivery. Okay. All right, well, we're going to be all over Uber's results tomorrow and watching your takeaways. Our Jackie Davalos, who covers Uber and Lyft for us. Thank you. Now, after taking on Spotify, musician Neil Young has set his sights on big banks. Young has called on baby boomers to, quote, ditch the companies contributing to the mass fossil fuel destruction of Earth. He proceeded to encourage fans to take their money out of J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. Coming up. On the heels of a massive deal with Activision, Microsoft has its eye on cybersecurity firm Mandiant. Could this be the next target in a massive buying spree? We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. More M&A for Microsoft? According to Bloomberg sources, the tech giant is in deal talks with cyber research and response firm Mandiant. An acquisition could bolster efforts to protect customers from hacks and security breaches, which Microsoft knows all too well about. Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities with us now. Dan, Microsoft on fire here. Is another deal a good deal for Microsoft? Look, Nadella right now is aggressively on M&A. I mean, it was Activision, but we talked about they're going to bulk up the enterprise piece. Cybersecurity, that's really been a core part of what Microsoft wanted to beef up. It would make a lot of sense for them to make an acquisition. And I think right now they're continuing to be on the aggressive, almost on the offensive in terms of M&A, just given their position of strength. Satya Nadella was on the show last year talking about cybersecurity as the new pandemic. He actually used that word. I want you to take a quick listen to that quote. Somebody described this to me like, while we have a pandemic, we have another uh, real pandemic, which is a cyber. Uh, and that's going to be there uh, with us. Uh, so, but at the same time, I think what is really now much more, I think, in the consciousness uh, of people is the level of attacks for sure have increased, but the need for our response uh, to be top notch has also increased. And look, Microsoft has had its own vulnerabilities over the last year. How does this make sense from a technological perspective, Dan? Does this give them better defense? Well, it would give them significant defense, and it goes back to the solar winds. I mean, that was a black eye for Microsoft, and I think that was the straw that brought the countless back. They want to have more control over their ecosystem. I think when you look at Mandian, the Navy SEALs of cybersecurity, I mean, that would clearly make sense. They could also go down vulnerability, names like Tenable and some other names out there. Because right now, Microsoft, they're trying to build a iron fence around their cloud ecosystem. The only thing that could ultimately disrupt this is the cybersecurity piece. And I think that's why M&A would make a ton of sense. This, you know, the market value of Mandiant now, you know, just over $4 billion. So certainly nothing compared to the size of the Activision deer, but be it deal. But does it concern you how much they're spending? Well, look, I think Microsoft for, for a while was obviously just building the cloud business. And I think Nadella, and they recognize within Redmond, now is the time to go on the offensive over the coming years. And it's really M&A. And they also know, importantly, a lot of those other tech stalwarts, they're in the midst of antitrust scrutiny. Microsoft knows they feel a little more Teflon-like to do M&A. Think about Nuance, got Activision, now potentially a cybersecurity deal. 
And I think this is really a different type of Microsoft looking over the coming years. And the Dell definitely has strut in his step in terms of M&A. All right, Dan Ives, Wedbush Security, something we're going to continue to track. Thanks. Coming up, in the race to quantum computing, D-Wave now going public via SPAC. We'll speak with the guy leading that deal, Emil Michael, former top Uber executive. He'll also give us his thoughts on Lyft's results. doesn't seem to have European officials worried. The company has again warned it could pull Facebook and Instagram out of Europe if it's prohibited from transferring user data back to the U.S. Bloomberg caught up with the EU's competition chief. Take a listen. I'm on Instagram, and if it doesn't work anymore, that would give me maybe another 10, 20 minutes per day. Vestager <laughs> saying that threats are never a good idea with the EU. Regulators from Europe and the U.S. are in negotiations to come up with a new data transfer agreement. Meantime, the race to build a quantum computer is heating up. Today, Canadian quantum computer maker D-Wave Systems is merging with blank check company DPCM, putting the combined company's value at $1.6 billion. Joining us now to break it all down, Emil Michael, DPCM chair and CEO. Emil, what is it about D-Wave that made you want to take this company public via SPAC? I mean, $300 million, that's a big boost. <laughs> yeah, well, what I liked about D-Wave is that they actually have products in market today. So this is not a, hey, we'll have a product five years from now, uh, and it's an R&D company and invest in it. It actually has products today. It's serving clients like Volkswagen, Save On Foods, has 12 big Fortune 1000 clients. So quantum computing is here today for D-Wave, and that's why I like it. Still, D-Wave is considered kind of an underdog in the quantum computing field when you look at folks like Google like Rigetti Computing, what is their special sauce you see when it comes to their technological approach that, that makes them a good bet in your view? Yeah, there's a few things. So number one, because they've been around for a while, a while their IP portfolio is enormous. That means patents and sort of the, the what they've built so far is a huge treasure trove and value creating um, set of IP. Second, their approach is the only approach that works for optimization problems, like employee scheduling, or imagine how a complex business um, schedules employees with their days off and hours work and so on. Uh, they can solve real world optimization problems today given their approach, and they're gonna build a new approach too, like Rigetti and like Google as well. The approach they're using, as I understand it, is called annealing. You know, explain to us what makes that special and different from you know, the approach some of these other competitors, quite frankly, are taking. Yeah. So the annealing approach is an approach that uh, I believe, and we think technologically, uh, we believe, can solve a certain set of problems that the other approaches cannot solve. It doesn't mean that annealing can solve every problem that quantum might solve, but it can, only, it can solve about $100 billion worth the total addressable market problems, and no one else has, has that approach. So that's what makes it unique. The other thing I'd add is that D-Wave has a brand new leadership team. Alan Barretts is an incredible leader. He's very commercial and technically deep. So it's got a fresh look at the world. It's got real big customers today. And it's got an approach that they they have a unique kind of lock on at the moment. Now, I got to ask you, Lyft earnings just out, beat on revenue, miss on riders. We're waiting for Uber earnings later this week. When you look at it, what is the future of ride hailing? Does it recover? Does it get back to pre-pandemic levels? I think I think it does. I think you'll see revenue from both Uber and Lyft on the ride side exceed pre-pandemic levels in Q4. Uh, and I think Lyft just proved that from a revenue standpoint, not necessarily from a rider standpoint. And that's because prices went up, right? Um, I think you'll both see prices moderate in 2022, riders come back, and you'll see this business growing again. I mean, no one who lives in a city can actually live without one of these services anymore. So it's just that people have been home and haven't been going to work. So as that moderates back, I think you'll see recovery in, in the rides business for both companies. 
And look, last time he was on the show, Dara Khosrowshahi, the CEO of Uber, predicted that rides would surpass pre-pandemic levels once again. That said, you know, you've made it no secret that you, you A, you're still a, a shareholder in Uber. You are not happy with the way things are going. You are not happy with the way the stock has languished. What are you looking for there? Is it, is it a strategy change? Um, I mean, I, frankly, I think they need to have a, a management change, like some uh, leadership uh, wake-up call. I mean, the stock now is where it was in 2015. That's seven years ago. Um, and so the, the businesses have been growing, but Wall Street is not rewarding them for it. And there's a reason. I think they lack confidence that this management team is going to innovate and is going to find cost savings to make it more profitable sooner. Um, and they've done a bunch of bad acquisitions that haven't helped. Uh, a management change like a new CEO, like a, like a Peloton style management change? Uh, How extreme I mean, are we talking here? Well, I mean, Dara's five years, you know, first five years is up this summer. And I think it'll be a point for the board and for shareholders to look up and say, well, this company went public at $45 a share. Where is it today? What are the goals? Have we hit them? And is you know, it, whether it's him or the team, is this team collectively the right team to take it forward and to regain momentum? I mean, seven years is a long time to wait for the stock to, to get back to even. What about the promise of Eats and the, the, the ambitious moves that Uber and Dara have made there? Quickly. I mean, I think, I think Eats is a great business. Thank God we started it way back when. And because you see what happens to Lyft when you're relying on one business. So I think Eats is a crown jewel. Now, I wish they hadn't lost the lead in market share to DoorDash, but there's a lot of room to run on Eats worldwide in a lot of different areas. And you see what GoPuff's doing. There's lots of angles you can take that business. So I like that business, and I hope they you know, regain the market share they've lost in the last couple of years. All right. Well, we'll be all over Uber's results later this week. Emil Michael, appreciate you joining us. We'll keep our eye on that SPAC. DPCM Capital Chair and CEO. Coming up, Apple launching a new feature that'll give merchants an alternative to Square. We've got all the details next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Apple is planning to release a much anticipated tap to pay feature on the iPhone later this year. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who of course covers Apple for us. What do we know, Mark, about how this new feature will work and what does it mean for Square? Yeah, thank you for having me. I mean, this feature is pretty simple, as we explained before. Uh, you basically turn your iPhone into a payment terminal, right? So if someone wants to pay for something, you can use your phone to take that. Uh, instead of a square reader, they can tap a credit card, they can tap an iPhone with Apple Pay, they can tap an Android phone with Google Pay. Any NFC uh, based wallet could be used just by tapping it on the back of an existing iPhone with an NFC chip, one of the newer phones. Uh, they've been including NFC in the iPhone since the iPhone 6 since 2014, so this goes way, way, way back. I'd be interested to see if that eventually comes to the iPad. In, in terms of Square, as you know, uh, Square sells a dongle or an input you can connect to your iPhone uh, either wirelessly or through uh, the lightning connector or headphone jack on an iPhone uh, to take credit card payments. Uh, so it's different because it doesn't require any external hardware. Uh, but Apple will be leveraging third-party payment networks such as Stripe and other potential partners to make this work. Uh, so it's possible that maybe one day Square will take advantage of this Apple technology. Uh, the the uh, caveat I will say is Apple, of course, is very likely to charge a percentage of all transactions. So maybe Square won't want to do that from that perspective. How much revenue could this drive for Apple? You know, Apple's services business at this point is a nearly $20 billion uh, per quarter business, right? They generated about $60 billion in change for the Apple 
uh, for com the, com the entire company over fiscal 2021. And every time they add a new service, a new point uh, of sale for the company, they're gonna continue to generate revenue, right? Apple Pay right now probably generates a couple billion dollars uh, per year for Apple because what Apple does is they take you know, a few cents on the dollar every time an Apple Pay transaction is done. They take that off the top for themselves for their services revenue. They're obviously probably gonna do this too uh, for this new uh, business register service. So this is another revenue driver long-term potentially. And, and when is this gonna launch? Is it timed with other Apple products? We know that you've been reporting on that March 8th event. So this is going to launch alongside iOS 15.4. Uh, which comes out in the first half of March, I'm told. Uh, obviously, they're going to hold that March 8th event for the new iPad and the iPhone and a new Mac. Uh, what this means, though, is that third-party payment companies are going to need to sign up for this and take advantage of it. So the tech's going to be ready in the first half of March. Who knows when Stripe and other companies will be able to start actually releasing apps that take advantage of this feature. Stripe says they'll launch in the spring, and there'll be more coming uh, probably later in the year. Got to ask your thoughts on this massive Peloton shakeup, given that you cover Peloton as well. 2,800 employees out. John Foley stepping down as CEO. Do you think you know, the next guy could get it right, Barry McCarthy? Do you think a deal is in the future? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to the merits of uh, cutting 20% of the workforce. Obviously, that's not uh, positive in, by any means, but Foley had to go. Uh, the number of missteps that happened under Foley's watch or decisions directly made by Foley over the last two years uh, are, in some, in some respects, pretty countless. And this is not just investors saying it. I mean, I can tell you we've had uh, the recalls that were mishandled regarding the tread. We had the child death. We had multiple advertising-related issues. But the most significant problem was they completely you know, mistimed and completely messed up their supply chain, not once, but twice, right? Once at the beginning of the pandemic and once at the end of the pandemic, right? This was supposed to be the time where Peloton was supposed to grow and become this shiny new company with a, you know, over $50 billion market cap. But because of their supply chain failures, we are where we are today. And of course, the CEO is responsible and he had to go. All right, well, we'll be covering it all as Peloton shifts into a new here, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, who covers Apple and Peloton for us. Thanks. Coming up, how to regulate stable coins. That was the focus of a House hearing on Capitol Hill. We're going to talk regulation and all things crypto with Chris Giancarlo, co-chair of Wilkie Digital and a former regulator himself. This is Bloomberg. From the start, our committee has recognized that the explosive growth of digital assets presents a variety of risk and opportunities for our economy and communities, especially communities of color that have been left behind by our financial system. In this committee, we have witnessed the payments industry address shifts in uh, customer and consumer demand and the never ending race to move money faster, cheaper uh, and better. Digital currencies like stable coins are a natural continuation of the same issues we've addressed in this committee over the years. And I might add in a bipartisan way. We cannot regulate out of fear of the future. Time now for our crypto report, Bitcoin, recording its longest winning streak since September, with investors at least starting to embrace riskier assets once again. Still volatility, the name of the game in that winning streak, not to last long. What should we read into the bounce back? Bloomberg Shanali Basik with us now for more on these crypto market moves. Crick Sonali, what are you reading into this? Yeah, we do have a nice little bounce back here in Bitcoin asset prices. You have it stabilizing now, though, Emily, over at around $44,000. And so it's been on a tear for the past week or so, now down just a scotch, but we do have a big rise. I also want to point out not just Bitcoin, but tether because it's a good day to talk about stable coins and not just cryptocurrency back to digital assets but cryptocurrencies that are back to the dollar we have a real rise in tether over the last couple of days you see that about 40 percent and remember tether is affiliated with bitfinex which is where the doj had seized 3.6 billion dollars uh, in bitcoin stolen in a hack from bitfinex and of course lawmakers were talking about stable coins today 
All right, Shanali, hang on. Regulators and lawmakers have been trying to make sense of the crypto landscape. Earlier, the House Financial Services Committee held a hearing to talk about just that and more specifically stable coins. Treasury Undersecretary for Domestic Finance, Nellie Leong, was the sole witness at this hearing. She made the case for the need to oversee stable coin issuers and regulate crypto intermediaries. I want to bring in our next guest now, Chris Giancarlo. He is senior counsel at the law firm Wilkie, Farr & Gallagher, where he works on the digital assets team, and also the former chair of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Shanali, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Emily, and thank you, Chris, for being here. Chris, I want to take a listen really quickly to something Nelly Liang had said, and specifically, this is about technology firms and its engagement in cryptocurrencies. This is the issue of the separation of banking and commerce has been an issue that Congress has uh, grappled with for many years. Um, in this case, we believe stable coins as a payment instrument um, should not be issued by a technology firm. Now, Chris, as a former regulator yourself, what do you make of that idea? Actually, uh, thanks, Anali. You know, I think that was perhaps one of the biggest uh, moments of the hearing today uh, uh, I think her comment was that uh, basically technology firms need not apply for the future of, of payments and finance, that that should be limited to banks and particularly insured uh, uh, depository institutions. I think that's a quite remarkable statement, knowing that, in fact, it's been the tech industry, it's been, it's been innovators, not from the banking sector, but from technology that have really explored the ability to make money more accessible, uh, less latent, and much faster. Uh, and so I thought I think that comment was pretty remarkable. I mean, Americans don't like it when government picks winners and losers, but that seemed to be what we were hearing. Well, you yourself work with a lot of different companies like NYDIG that does work with banks to try to make cryptocurrencies more accessible. How may a comment like that take form when it comes to government regulation? Will it stop big tech companies from trying to get into cryptocurrency again? Well, the reference was made to the separation between investment banking and commercial banking and the Glass-Steagall Act as a basis for this uh, separation from technology firms from payments. But in fact, as we know, Glass-Steagall was mostly repealed uh, by Congress. And so it's not really a a living uh, pr precedent for what is sought to be done here. So, as you know, the President's Working Group, uh, which came out with a report of, uh, not too long ago, has proposed that really the development of stable coins be left to uh, the banking uh, industry under bank-like uh, regulation. And although there was a lot of un unanimity in today's report, certainly congressmen and women on both sides of the aisle seem to be quite aligned in the need for greater clarity, perhaps for congressional action, uh, for the, the importance that stablecoins are increasingly playing in the market, um, and the need for U.S. innovation. I think there was less unanimity around the idea of whether, bank regula whether the bank regulatory uh, regime should be brought to bear uh, to regulate stablecoins, and specifically whether stablecoin operators are, would be required uh, to be banking institutions. And so with that comment that you just pointed to, uh, that, that really technology firms should not apply, I think that kind of went against the grain, certainly at least half of the comments that we heard in today's hearing. Hmm. Chris, you know better than just about anyone how hard it is to keep up with financial technology, and the crypto marketplace is moving, evolving so fast. Can regulators keep up and then keep keeping up? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, almost by definition, regulators in our democratic societies never keep up. It's a, very, it's a different approach than, say, Europe, which tries to adopt regulation in advance of innovation and tell innovators to actually innovate to the regulatory standard. In the United States, our approach has generally been to let innovation develop and then regulators catch up. So I'd say regulators catching up is not a design failure. It's kind of a design mm -hmm. feature of our system. What it means is that our innovators innovate to solve real problems. And what's happened in stablecoins is they have innovated to solve, quite frankly, the shortcomings of the existing banking and payment system, which we know, increasingly know, has been under-inclusive of our fellow citizens, is too slow. It, it costs too much. There's too much rent-seeking behavior. And so um, this innovation that we're looking at, that Congress, as you say, is trying to catch up, has been solving real-world problems. And I think 
and as I say this as a former regulator who's appeared before that committee many times, the challenge is how do we bring um, clear rules that protect against fraud and manipulation and bad behavior, but allow innovation to continue to make our financial system better, faster, right. more inclusive, and less costly. So then the question is when will we see crypto regulation, stablecoin regulation this year? How soon? Well, I, I, what you saw today actually is a real step forward from when I was appearing before this committee a few years ago. And they, quite frankly, were asking the basic elementary questions. What you really heard today was congressmen and women who are much further up the learning curve, understand the challenges, and are really grappling with it. Now, the fact of the matter is this year is an election year. This is a year where congressmen and women are looking for direction from the public but are unlikely to take, I think, legislative action this year. But the discussions that are taking place this year, I think, will result in legislation once we get through the election. Mm -hmm. And there's there's new uh, coalitions in the House ready to put this forward. And I hope Chris, they're bipartisan. We have less than a minute here left, but your opinion on this. A lot of people on Wall Street complain that the CFTC and the SEC don't talk. They are on different turfs. I'm wondering, especially because Gary Gensler was at the CFTC, will there be more coordination? And is this time any different? Well, Sonali, you're absolutely right. I was shocked when I arrived at the CFTC at how little the CFTC and the SEC talked on a regular basis. And I think one of the achievements uh, that we reached was to have a much more open dialogue. Chairman J uh, Jay Clayton and I established a regular cryptocurrency ad hoc uh, joint committee between our agencies that spoke regularly. I hope that's been continued under the new administration. I don't, I don't know the case, and I'm not drawing criticism. I just hope it has been continued, because it's so important that those two market regulators speak regularly, especially with this new and fast-moving, as you say, innovation. Indeed. All right. Chris Giancarlo, former CFTC chair, and our very own Shanali Basik. Thank you both. Coming up, how to improve the technical interview process. We're going to see how one young company is trying to reduce the bias in that process and the inefficiencies one interview at a time. That's next. This is Bloomberg. estimated 3.9 million unfilled technical jobs in the United States and companies are constantly looking for ways to assess and hire top technical talent quickly. The technical interview is famous in Silicon Valley but often benefits those who already have an unfair advantage. Enter Byteboard, which offers a new way to evaluate job applicants by running real-world engineering exercises rather than just obscure algorithms. Joining me now, Byteboard's co-founder Sargon Kar and Nicole Hearts and Hurley, thank you so much for joining us. As I understand it, you're both engineers. You both went through the traditional recruiting process. Sargon, let's start with, start with you. What's broken about the way things are done now? Yeah, so like you mentioned, thank you, Emily, for having us on the show. Nikki and I met while we were engineers at Google and have gone through the inter interview process ourselves. And, you know, you're in San Francisco, and hopefully you're a Warriors fan. The best way I'd like to describe uh, the way that the technical <laughs> interviews are broken is, you know, when the Warriors went out to recruit Steph Curry, they didn't put him in a room and put him in front of a whiteboard and have him draw plays. They saw how he played on the court. And the way traditional technical interviews work today, we were in rooms in front of a whiteboard reciting very theoretical algorithmic knowledge. It's completely broken and just separate from what the way that engineers work on the job day to day. I am a Warriors fan indeed, so I appreciate the metaphor. Talk to us about who gets left behind in the classical technical interview and who has that advantage. Is it generally male candidates, Nicole? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, traditional software engineering interviews tend to focus on what you learn in a computer science classroom, so highly theoretical knowledge. Um, and what that means is we're often leaving out folks that are coming from untraditional backgrounds, so folks that you know are self-taught, that have taught themselves by being on the internet, or folks that came through a coding boot camp. My sister went through a coding boot camp and is now a senior engineer at Dropbox. Um, additionally, kind of exactly as you hit on, software engineering interviews data shows they're super inconsistent, um, and so what that means is that. You 
you know, only a third of candidates are consistent in their performance, um, but women are seven times more likely to drop out of the interview process after a poor interview experience. And what that means is we have a leaky pipeline that is just validating, you know, the perspective of, you know, when I look at the industry, I don't see people that typically look like me. And so if I go through an interview process that is super inconsistent, that I fail, I reflect on it and I think that means I'm not a great engineer. But really what we found is it's not candidates that are failing the technical interview process. It's the technical interview process that is failing them. You recently raised $5 million in funding led by Cowboy Ventures, and you're trying to take on a $100 billion recruiting software industry. Uh, Sargon, what makes you think that your way is better? Like Nikki mentioned, we both are engineers, and when we, were, when we met each other, we kind of started venting about the interview process ourselves, and we looked at ourselves and said, who better to redesign the broken interview process than engineers that have gone through it ourselves? And a lot of the existing tools that exist in the industry today have approached this problem by looking at what companies are missing. It's an inefficient problem. You know, it takes a really long time to interview engineers, and they've digitized this broken interview process, but they haven't actually stopped to ask the question, how do we fix the broken interview process? So Nikki and I approach this from a candidate perspective. What do we want the interview process to look like? And so Byteboard is a project-based interview that actually evaluates for skills that are used on the job. It allows companies to hire in the best technical talent in a way that allows them a higher degree of confidence and, like you mentioned, a higher ROI in terms of time to hire. There's so much movement happening in the job market right now. I recently interviewed the CFO of Alphabet, Ruth Porat, about the great resignation, as it's been called. Take a listen to what she had to say. I don't think it's uh, the great resignation. I think it's the great reshuffle. And people are reflecting on what do they want and how do they want to work and how do they want to live their life. So I think for all of us thinking about what does that mean for our institutions, it is about evolving the way we we, we work, the way we interact, the expectations that we have. Nicole, what trends are you seeing in the job market right now? Are engineers reshuffling, reflecting, and what do they want? Absolutely. Candidates are definitely reshuffling. And I think one of the things that is incredibly important for companies to realize is candidates have options, which means you need to offer an excellent candidate experience to ensure that if you do make an offer, they're going to go with your company. Otherwise, you spent a ton of time interviewing and the candidate doesn't even end up joining. And so to ensure that you offer a great candidate experience, you have to offer an experience where candidates feel like they're fairly evaluated, where they feel like they're able to connect with your team and understand what it would be like to actually work at your company. And with a tool like Byteboard, you're able to ensure that you're assessing for the right skills, offer an experience that candidates love, and sure that you have the time to connect with candidates in a really authentic way. Now, your clients so far include Lyft, Figma, Betterment. So you are racking up some of the more established names. That said, I'm thinking about this statistic that was incredibly depressing, that women-founded companies got just 2% of venture capital funding last year. You know, what needs to change, Sargon, despite so much more awareness about the need for diversity, the need for diversity among entrepreneurs just like yourselves, why isn't it happening? Yeah, it's a great question. And Nikki and I just went through our fundraise process. And we were fortunate. We had a lot of interest and were intentional by, about the cap table that we designed. But you know, we had a tough time, too. And we faced a lot of biases in the process. So our hope is by building something like Byteboard into a successful big business, we lead by example to show that great ideas can come from anyone, can come from anywhere, and can look like founders like Nikki and myself. So, Nikki, last quick question. Like, give us the vision for the future. Where are you? Where's the company a year from now? Yeah, we're so excited about this next phase for Byteboard. We're spending a ton of time right now hiring and growing our company so that we can actually meet the demand that we're seeing for companies that want to use Byteboard in their hiring process. Um, we're also launching some really exciting new product offerings, including our Byteboard hiring consortium that will basically allow candidates to take one Byteboard interview and share it with every single company in the Byteboard hiring consortium. You can imagine, as a candidate, if you're interviewing with 10 companies, that's a lot of time spent in interviews. Um, and by using this piece of the process. Can candidates are able to save a ton of time and companies are able to move quickly and offer an excellent candidate experience. So we're really excited about growing our team and, and offering new okay. products that help folks hire better. We'll keep watching you both. Byteboard co-founder Sargon Carr, Nicole Hartz and Hurley, thank you for joining us. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Big show tomorrow. We're going to continue our earnings coverage. Lyft's John Zimmer will be with us. Also, we've got a live conversation with Disney after the bell. CEO Bob Chapek here 
on Beat Tech. You don't want to miss it. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.